Thanks, Jerry and everybody, and nice to see you all here. Thanks for showing up on a Thursday night. So yeah, my name is Brock Dahlman from the Oxford Arts and Ecology Center and the Water Institute, and with Kate Lundquist here as well. Uh, our plan tonight is that I'll, we're going to split, we're splitting our talk into two halves. So I'll do the first half, and that's a bit more just on background, history, beaver biology, some of the context of beaver in California, kind of bigger picture. And then um, based on this online format, uh, I'll stop sharing screen, Kate will share her screen, and then she'll drill it down into more specifics and details and um, kind of uh, elaborate on what Jerry was talking about there with respect to this exploratory concept, this idea um, about beavers in West Marin and, and specifically pondering them in, in Alima Creek. So uh, is that all working? Sound is good for everybody? Yeah? Yep. Hey, you got anything to add before we transition? Just want to say hi. I know my uh, screen name is OAC of the organization, but I'm Kate and worked with Brock in the Water Institute and happy to be with y'all here tonight. Take it away, Brock. There's Gail. Hi, Gail. Fine. All right. So um, just before, while you're setting that up, I would just say that um, if folks don't mind holding off on uh, interrupting the talk with questions, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I'll be tracking those as we go. And if there's anything super urgent, we can, um, when we do the, the switch over from Brock to me, we can address those then. And then afterwards, we're planning to have a, a more robust question and answer moment and discussion. So thank you. All right. Okie doke. Well, there is a cute little beaver. Our friend Rusty Cohen, who's an amazing photographer over in the Napa system, is always sending us beautiful beaver pictures, which we love to share his work. And so, yeah, we're this tonight's really uh, overall going to be talking about the feasibility of restoration of beaver. West Marin overall, but specifically for you all, we'll drill down and, and talk about some of the ideas we observed and, and have actually yet to observe more in Alima Creek. And um, a little bit of background is uh, hopefully most folks, since you're not that far away in Alima, been to Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, um, you know, above the bustling metropolis of Occidental there in West Sonoma County on Coleman Valley Road. We're on the Eastern end of the road. It's an 80 acre piece of property. It's actually nine of us that co-own it as an intentional community called Sewing Circle. We've been there since 1994. And then we started the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center back then as a 501c3. I won't get into all the programs, but in this image, you can see we have big, beautiful organic gardens and wildlands and we have permaculture programs and uh, resilient community design. We work a lot with tribal entities, school garden teacher training programs. That garden in front of you is the sixth oldest certified organic farm in California, actually. And then in the Water Institute, we, um, which is, is an acronym for Watershed Advocacy Training Education and Research Institute, we um, have been focusing on beaver primarily. And we're really all about collaboration. And so I'm not going to go over all those, those logos down at the bottom of the, the slide there, but just to say that we have a long history of really uh, engaging in, in collaborative conservation from the ridgeline to the reef. We really think about this idea we call the basins of relations. Um, one of the interesting things is, is, is I'm personally a wildlife biologist, restoration ecologist, formerly really an endangered species vertebrate biologist. And so we got into the game of really paying attention to, especially in the Russian River Basin, where we drain to uh, OACs in the headwaters of a tributary called Dutchville Creek, which drains down to Maya Rio and out to the ocean at Jenner. It, the loss of coho salmon and in the overall in, in coastal California and that you can see in that chart in the upper left there just overall in California, just the rapid decline of coho salmon. And so we were involved in salmonid restoration and recovery and began hearing about and reading papers and scientific journal articles out of Oregon and Washington and, and began thinking about beaver and the North American beaver and beginning to wonder, well, what's up with beaver in California? And so we began really looking at that and finding other, what are known as beaver believers out there um, and looking at that. It is fun just to know we, we have done some 
we'll mention some historical ecology papers we worked on where we actually found the, the native word for beaver in over 60 California indigenous languages. And so for you all in West Marin in Coast Miwok territory, we would just want to acknowledge the Coast Miwok, the territory you're in, and, and their word, which I'm not exactly sure how that gets pronounced, but ka, -ka maybe. Um, and so, and we are talking about the North American beaver. You know, in the world, there are two species of beavers. There's North American beaver, Castor canadensis, and there's a beaver called Castor fiber, which occurs throughout the British Isles, Europe, uh, Asia, Russia, over into upper China, Mongolia, actually. But our, be our campaign is really about bringing back beaver in the state of California. So we've uh, conveniently removed the grizzly bear off of the flag since conveniently the grizzly bear is no longer in the state and put our beaver on there. And really this campaign is fundamentally about basic education and outreach. We do a lot with citizen science, uh, research and demonstration around relationship with beaver. And we're also engaged with policy. And Kate's gonna talk about a lot more about the research demonstration policy piece. The nice little beaver dam on Sonoma Creek, which for us in Sonoma County and in the greater Bay Area, uh, Sonoma Creek is by far the place that has the most beavers. There's a little bit of beavers down near the raceway by Tole Creek. And then otherwise you need to go over to Napa to get some local beavers or you get into the Delta and Martinez and that. But um, as far as adjacency to Marin County, really Sonoma Creek's our best beaver habitat. We did produce this wonderful booklet that we think is wonderful at least, Beaver in California, Creating a Culture of Stewardship. And we can provide you the link, but that's a downloadable PDF of a, of a document that we have on our website where we're really just trying to support people in becoming more aware about beaver and taking care of uh, beavers and, and ultimately facilitating the restoration of either if we've got beavers working with the beaver and this bigger question, if you will, about reintroducing them, which we're going to get more into. Um, many, may, many people know about the, the gold rush in California. And, um, but what precedes the gold rush in California has been named the California fur rush. And the, there were Boston sea captains and Russian fur trappers, uh, Fort Ross in Northern Sonoma County that was created in 1812 was an outpost for fur trappers out of Russia who were primarily looking at marine fur, fur seals, sea otters. But we did find in some of the papers we'll talk about where uh, those fur traders in the late 1700s, 1790s, 1800, 1810, 12, we're actually trading for beaver pelts with indigenous tribes on the coast. It's not really until we get the 1828, 1829, 30, 1830 era where the, the mountain man type beaver trappers that most people think about beaver folks, the Jedediah Smiths, the, the Walker, Carson, you know, those types of folks who came over from the east or the north and really trapped out the Sierra and the Central Valley. But for us on the coast, our beaver trapping got going, um, you know, upwards of 20 to 30 years prior. And beavers were famously made into hats, like the classic top hat, where in the upper right, those are a gland that beavers have, where they get, you can get castoreum, which is a scent used in perfume. It used to be used as a flavoring and things like vanilla ice cream. Um, and what is worth noting in California is that by 1916, we were down to less than a thousand beavers in California. The trapping had been so extensive. And this map there on the right shows you that basically we had a few beavers left in the mouth of the Klamath, a few beavers up in the kind of above Shasta there, a little bit in the, in the Delta zone, South San Joaquin and down on the Colorado River. And they were actually listed as a, was it, we didn't have endangered species lists back then, but by 1911, the California legislature had actually put protective status on the beavers. And there's a whole interesting story about beavers being protected in 1911 and then not protected by the Delta farmers and then protected again in the 20s and not protected and a whole interesting piece of that puzzle. One thing that happened is that the division of wildlife back in the day, of division of fish and game, I mean, um, actually moved beavers around in California from 1923 to 1950. So on this map here, you can see all the little, all those little dots across the map are places that the state agency actually moved beavers and they brought them in from different places. And it is worth noting and kind of interesting that the, um, 
this quote from 1942 that it was it is now understood that soil erosion and shortage of water in some places resulted from the destruction of beavers which formerly built and kept in repair the dams on upper reaches of many streams and so they people back in the day really recognized the importance and the value of beavers and watersheds and water quantity and quality and thus really went after it in california translocated almost 1200 beavers throughout the state during that a period of time all the other western states um who were doing that kind of work back then didn't move more than 100 or 200. In fact, and at the bottom of the slide here, there were four beaver released in what is now Point Reyes National Seashore back in 1947. And they were put in Glenbrook Creek, which is right next to Muddy Hollow, draining into Lehman Tour there. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear that those beavers survived and we don't really, nobody knows. Maybe they got an acute case of lead poisoning from the end of a shotgun or not, but um, many of us, those of us who've spent time in the Muddy Hollow Trail in Glenbrook think it would be a nice place to have beavers again. Um, and what's interesting then is uh, actually Idaho really got after this and they started parachuting beavers out of planes in 1948. And there's a wonderful video actually that you can find online if you want, if you just put in Idaho parachuting beavers, it's an interesting film. But California also got in on that game and actually did parachute beavers into the El Dorado National Forest up in the, in the Sierras and south of Tahoe there. And again, you can see that this poster that we ended up finding in, in some archives about the idea that beaver dams in the mountains could save water for fish, wildlife, and agriculture. And, and so they were planting them out. There was a report written about the status of beavers in 1942. And functionally, this is the last report that really comprehensively dealt with beavers in the state. And again, you can kind of see that the sense of where they thought back then the native range of the upper Klamath Shasta area, parts of the upper Sacramento Pitt River, the Central Valley, Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and then that little patched area down by the, uh, on the Klamath, I mean, on the Colorado River, excuse me was where back then it was asserted that they were native to. And thus the sense was that they weren't native on the coast um, bay in the Bay Area proper, nor up and down the coast south of the Klamath, nor in the Sierras above a thousand feet. That didn't sit well with a number of us. And so actually Kate, myself with a group of folks have published two peer reviewed papers in the California Department of Fish and Games Journal, one about historical ecology of beaver in the Sierra Nevada, and one, as you can see here, was the historical range of beaver in coastal California. And this map that we have there on the left shows those hatched areas, the three areas that they thought back in the 40s were the native range, and our proposed expanded range based on the papers we published based on information that we collected um, or museum specimens or, or archaeological specimens, we did various documented records, beaver place names, a bunch of exhaustive uh, research in looking at beavers. Unfortunately, we didn't find a lot, to be honest with you, for Marin. There's one mention of beavers on the east side around San Rafael. So West Marin, we're, we're a little bit, we can talk more about this in a bit um, once after Kate goes. But I just want to kind of uh, pull out a little bit and talk about just a basic, some basic biology about beavers. Um, one thing to note about them is they're a very adaptable organism and they're basically a generalist. And so they can be in, in high mountain lakes, they can be in desert streams, they can be in urban corridors, they can build dams, they don't have to build dams, they can build classic stick lodges, they can burrow into the bank. They're all the same beaver, Castor canadensis, they're a large rodent. If you know about rodents, if you look at the teeth on a mouse or a rat or a porcupine, they're a large rodent. They're actually the second largest rodent on the planet after the capybara of South America. And they famously have that big flat tail. They've got a really cool little uh, claw on their back foot that allows them to groom. You can see that they are mammals and therefore <laughs> They have mammary glands and they're interesting in that beavers, um, unlike many what we think about rodents um, that breed a lot, beavers tend to just breed once a year. They have small litters 
of, of little kits. They can have, you know, one to two to three, sometimes four. They tend to have a pair of adults. They might have that season's kits. They might have a yearling from last year and a juvenile from two years before that live as a family group. So they're, they're, they have a long-term investment. Um, we think they're pretty darn creative as well and such. And one of the things though, is that they are an aquatic mammal. And again, they, uh, they famously either build these lodges, like you see that most people think about a floating stick, not a floating, but a stick lodge that's based on an island out in the middle of a lake that they can enter from under the water or that image on the left where in a river system, which is mostly what we see around here, especially in coastal Californian beavers, where they make a tunnel though, where they enter underneath the water and they burrow in and they make a den that might be in soil or underneath a root water and the roots of a tree. And they, because they're more river-based system beavers versus lake-based beavers. But they need that deep water, not only because that's how they are most efficient and for foraging and for cutting trees down and other vegetation, but they also need it for uh, protection from predators. And Jerry was talking about the mountain lion work and that picture in the back of there. And thank you for working on that. And now there's lots of mountain lions and the dominant predator of beaver besides humans in California are actually mountain lions. They're really adept at eating beavers. And that's a, a bit of a conundrum when we reintroduce beavers is how do we protect them in the beginning from mountain lion predation actually. Interestingly, beavers are really understood to be what we would call in ecology a keystone species where the habitat beavers create disproportionately creates more habitat for other species beyond just the beavers. The sage grouse people in, in the, in the um, arid mountain west of say Nevada really value beavers. Many species of trout, Lahontan cutthroat trout, we'll talk more about coho and steelhead, elk, moose in the high country or the high northern latitudes, pond turtles, various species of frogs like cascades frogs in the Sierra Nevada, willow flycatcher in the lower right there is in the Sierra Nevada, clearly being shown to be codependent with beaver habitat. We've even found blackback woodpeckers benefiting from beavers when they make ponds that kill lodgepole pines that had been invading dry meadows become habit nesting habitat for blackback woodpeckers, which are mostly a fire dependent woodpecker species. What's really interesting about beavers is that, especially when they make dams, is that dam slows that flow, it spreads that water out, it's a form of flooding and <laughs> We'll talk more about flooding relative to Lima Creek, but when it's good flooding, good inundation, it creates significant habitat, diversity of habitat. It slows that water down. It can increase that recharge of water, increase the, the, the flow downstream, help cool water down in, in um, various systems, which is all good for salmonids. And the salmonid we've really been thinking a lot about again is coho salmon and steelhead trout for sure, but especially coho. And I think we really recognize that the Tamales Bay watershed, especially through Lagunitas, through Olima Creek, in part uh, Walker Creek to some degree, uh, further down on the around Southern Marin there on the coast and Pine Gulch in the Russian River, that coho salmon are a, a fish that is well documented in areas where there are beavers further north and in Oregon, Washington to really benefit from the kinds of habitat that beaver create. And so we're really looking at, are inspired by the idea of trying to bring back beaver in part as a coho recovery strategy beyond the fact that we just like beavers. Um, what's interesting to note and in and, and other places in California, one of the benefits or environmental services that beaver provide is a water quality benefit. And this is a, a image of South Lake Tahoe and where Taylor Creek is. And that Taylor Creek system in the Forest Service land, this paper um, back from 2007, looking at the benefit of these beaver ponds and the wetlands that they create in the vegetation being a place where uh, phosphorus, for instance, was actually being sequestered by the vegetation instead of delivered to Lake Tahoe, which is phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment are things that we know have been uh, impacting the water quality of the famously blue Lake Tahoe. So we really think that beavers help keep Tahoe blue and could use more of them up there. But everywhere where we are, there are nutrient issues and sediment issues um, impacting water quality. 
And then there's some really interesting work around climate change and water and whether there's droughts and deluges and the image on the, the left of really showing how much water beaver can hold on the landscape and rehydrate it. And then that picture on the right there of the sharp spire up in, in, in Idaho from 2018. And you can see the whole place is burned out except for that riparian corridor right there in the middle where the beavers were that retained that moisture and was less flammable. And through Joe Wheaton's work at the state, Utah State, they really noted the benefit of that habitat. It became a refugia for wildlife fleeing the fire. It retained that complexity. It's a wellspring in that area for the regrowth of that area. And actually, uh, Dr. Emily Fairfax, um, who's now down at Channel Islands, University of Channel Islands, has recently published a paper looking at what she's called Smokey the Beaver and the, the relationship of beaver in fire resiliency. So not just water, but fire. And really honoring again that these beaver dams are really about, especially right now, we're just talking about drought, that when there's limited water, is, is it water scarce or is it really about storage scarce? And how do we slow it and spread it and sink it and store it and share it and, and recharge groundwater? And beavers are so excellent at that. This is just a series of images from a, a woman named Carol Evans who works for the BLM in the Elko district. So we're over into Nevada, Elko County, Nevada, kind of halfway between the city of Elko and Reno, if people know that area, Winnemucca. Um, and you know, your high elevation desert, six inches of rain on average, snow in the winter, sagebrush sea. And so you can see the Susie Creek here in 1992. And then what they did is they pulled the cows off of grazing just during the hot season. And that allowed that corridor to begin to revegetate. And then the beavers showed back up. And by 2012, the beavers had fully been making a series of dams. They had re-wetted the stream. It had gone perennial and the native trout were actually returning as well as a number of, of plant species. And the stream was re-perennializing. And it was just about grazing management changes and, and then really stop killing the beavers basically and let them do what they do. So in these incised streams, we really talk about, we wanna fight that incision with incisors because beavers upgrade instead of degrade systems, they hold material and they aggrade it. And, and um, that's how they can create these wetted riparian corridors and, and beaver wetlands that can actually store carbon and do carbon sequestration. While we're talking a lot about beaver dams, there was a study actually up in the, in the uh, Smith River system where they looked at the uh, bank burrows of, from beavers and, and the material, if you can see underwater below where the beavers store material in the, in the actual riverbed. And these folks up there called those bank lodges river reefs. And they documented all these species of fish and frogs and newts, Jerry, there's one of your newts, um, benefiting from these river reefs that were created by the beavers just in the bank burrow. They weren't even dam building beavers. And we're clear that beavers are ultimately not a silver bullet, but we don't think they deserve a, a lead bullet necessarily. And so um, working on beavers though, you definitely feel like sometimes you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And I'm gonna stop sharing here and I'm gonna turn this over to Kate and I'm gonna let her take that and um, Thanks, Brock. There you go. There you go. All right. Can you see my screen? All right. Yay. Well, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Brock. I'm going to talk to you all about just this process that Jerry talked a little bit about. Thanks to Jerry, we were invited to come down to Marin and start working with a bunch of folks involved in different Marin organizations to try to answer this question, would it be feasible to bring back beaver? And so we were calling it a feasibility assessment and focus only in West Marin watersheds. And we did get funded by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to do this. So thank you to them for that support. And the goal was to determine if and where beaver restoration would be appropriate in West Marin County. And so we've been heading it up with the gracious help and assistance over several years now from our stellar steering committee, which are all listed below. And we have Jerry on the call. We also have Gail on the call. But we also um, had Nancy Scolari and Sally Gale from the Marin RCD and then Eric Etlinger from 
MMWD and Preston Brown from Spawn. So a great group of folks that have been able to provide us with a lot of insights. And so there were several components to this feasibility proposal. One was to just look at the physical conditions first to determine if there is suitability in terms of flow and food and channel and all of those kind of things. And so we did some modeling and that has been completed and we have done some site visits. And then next was to figure out what's the political terrain like and the landowner tolerance and is there interest on the community's part and support. And so that's why we're here tonight. This is actually the first public presentation, technically public, uh, that we've done so far to talk about this. And so we're really excited to get your input and feedback as a result of this conversation and presentation. And then ultimately, once we complete the process, all of this will get written up in a, a document that will then uh, have some uh, recommendations for folks to take and run with or not, depending on what the results are. So um, there you have that. So Brock mentioned a few of where we have beaver uh, in Sonoma County. This is the best database we have currently on beaver distribution in California. Our uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife does not have the capacity to track beaver distribution. And so we're relying on iNaturalist and it's getting better and there's a lot more, uh, there are a lot more data points being added um, every year. And so, all of these little red dots are places where sign of beaver have been um, documented. And so, as you can see, we've got a lot in Sonoma Creek and over here in Tole. They have, after 137 year absence, made their way back to main stem Russian River. So they do disperse. That's part of what the juveniles do once it's time for them to move out. And so, you know, they do have a long way to come if they were going to try to make it overland to West Marin. So, um, of course, then everyone asks, well, why don't we just move them over here? Can't we just relocate them? Every state in the West relocates beaver as a part of um, their non-lethal management and conservation efforts. California is still trying to work out that process, um, has not been interested in it, but we've been working with them a lot and there's a lot of conversation. I can talk more about that. This is um, my partner, Kevin and I relocating beaver in Colorado and also in Washington state. So current beaver policy is, is fairly basic. Um, thankfully in 2019, AB 273 was passed and that was to protect wild wildlife from recreational trapping, in particular fur bearers and non-game mammals, and beaver are considered a fur bearer. So that means now that the 42 counties where we were able to recreationally trap beaver without any bag limits, um, those now, um, those rights have been taken away. And so that's going to help the beaver population get a little more robust. And um, the department has been um, really great to work with in the fact that now they've got this um, Keep Me Wild uh, part of their website where we helped with um, providing them information to support landowners in, in determining how to live with beaver and practice coexistence techniques. The main concern now though is depredation. Um, you know, there's a lot of people living in California and there's a lot of ag. And so there's a lot of potential for human beaver conflict. And so um, right now the department is required to give depredation permits to any owner or tenant that is suffering damage by beaver. And we are currently working on this right now. We, we submitted a rule change petition with the Fish and Game Commission to see if we could change the language to May and to really put in some language about um, giving the department more leeway to uh, to condition their permits to make sure that they that the landowners are exhausting all non-lethal techniques first and also really trying to account for any listed species that might be harmed by the depredation of beaver since a lot of listed species depend on beaver habitat as Brock already talked about and currently right now uh, it's legally, we're not allowed to possess or move beaver. However, we have uh, recently gotten permission to do a relocation 
uh, with a sovereign tribe. And so that's one area of exploration where we're, we're starting to collaborate with the department on a beaver relocation project. And we're hoping that that process will uh, provide um, an opportunity to answer a lot of their concerns so that they will be more open to moving beaver in other places. All right, I have lost my cursor, there we are. Um, so this whole process is called beaver restoration and it's a, it's a form of process-based restoration, which is a whole design methodology and science that's really well developed and has been super well articulated in these two documents that have come out recently, sorry about that. Um, so if any of you are involved in any kind of in-stream restoration, this is a really great manual to look at and just um, get more schooled about ways to work with materials that's super low tech and low cost, but high yield and high effect. And beaver are a form of restoration. Working with beaver is a form of restoration as well, which is why we're interested in seeing if there's a role for them in Marin County, in West Marin. And you may have heard the term beaver dam analog. That's basically beaver mimicry. There's a lot of different types of in-stream structures that are used in this form of process-based restoration. And California has definitely started installing a lot of these structures all over the state with a lot of success, as you can see up here. And this is the Scott River where they have coho salmon that really have benefited from these uh, beaver dam analogs that they've put in. We've been working with a lot of folks to start putting them up in our headwaters to keep more water on the landscape. Um, and they're also, you know, a lot of folks up in the Klamath watershed are using these as well. And now you can see them being used uh, it, in the foothills. And they can be used both to mimic beaver and try to encourage beaver to go where you want them, especially if you have beaver already on your site, you can reinforce their dams or you can build dams amongst their dams and help them last longer during high flows. Or if you're in a place that doesn't have beaver, you can put them in with the hopes of mimicking beaver and encouraging, you know, setting up the habitat so that if you were to one day relocate or if beaver showed up on their own, they would have really good habitat. And so that's something for, um, you all in West Marin to think about that that's something you could start with right away um, and do it in concert with a process towards trying to uh, start a relocation pilot. So we this is the model that we worked with a bunch of partners to create. This is a Utah State University product that they have done for many different states in the West and it's called the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool or BRAT. And it is a GIS based model that takes a lot of different inputs, vegetation, slope, drainage area, base flow, stream power, two year flood, stream power, and combines it all to just give you some broad stroke sense of where you might want to think about moving beaver to. Where would you get your most bang for your beaver buck. And this can work too for just in-stream structures as well. If you're not even putting beaver in, you can use this model. And so it's a very detailed model and I highly recommend you go to the website and check it out. There's, you can surf it and go zoom in to your favorite part and look at what the model says. Um, all of these things are a combination of considerations that then get distilled into one layer, which I'll show you right now. And so this is the conservation and restoration opportunity layer. And um, all models are, are flawed. So when you look at it, you have to, you know, know the area and also you know, make sure that you understand why things are the certain color they are. However, when we started looking around in West Marin at this model, you can see that um, for a variety of reasons, um, lack of vegetation in some places or high flows that might blow dams out. This, this model is really uh, trying to um, support people in choosing places where dams, there would be as many dams as possible persisting as long as possible. Um, and so 
Um, you can see here that in Alima Creek and certainly out on the seashore, there are lots of places that show up in the highest and high um, category, which some of them maybe just need a little bit of vegetation. Certainly every place in the county could have potential. Um, you just have to you know, start somewhere and narrow your search and then ultimately get out on the landscape and check it out. From this, we as a committee certainly talked about a lot of different places of you know, where would it make sense to get out on the landscape and do site visits. Um, and try not to make ourselves sick over these models because they can be really complex and sometimes you do wanna just take, take an aspen <laughs> and uh, yes, see your doctor. So we did conduct a few site visits, uh, several actually, and uh, you know, based on the relocation projects that we've worked with in other states, they have scorecards and different considerations that we also take into consideration when we do these site visits. You know, really important to make sure that one, there's enough water at base flow for beaver to persist. They need water to survive being preyed upon, as Brock said. And so escape cover is another really important thing, making sure they have at least three feet of you know, depth in their pools. And then food is really critical. So making sure there are the kind of species that they favor, they tend to prefer willows and cattails, um, but they also need to chew trees because their teeth are constantly growing. And so they'll chew on anything just to you know, keep their teeth sharp, but they tend to stay confined to their channel and don't want to venture further than a hundred feet outside of, of the water uh, to eat if they don't have to. And so um, having enough food close in is really important to, to support them and make sure that they can persist. And then if it is a place that would be conducive for dam building, making sure that there's enough dam building materials as well. So the big question is, well, what, it, what would the landowner acceptance of beaver be? And so this is what we're relying on you all and um, our committee to, to help guide us is, you know, what do people think? Are, are people aware of beaver? Do people know what beaver can, you know, the benefits of beaver, but also what are the concerns? Are they aware of the concerns? You know, beaver definitely are, they're, they're willow farmers. They're, tr they're wanting to expand aquatic habitat if they can so that they have more places to find food. Uh, often in really deeply incised channels, they aren't successful in getting out on the floodplain and expanding further. And we have lots of examples where they do just stay confined to the channel and kind of go up and down. Ideally though, if you have a spot where you want to reconnect the stream to the, the, the floodplain and there's space and, and um, you know landowner interest, beaver could be really helpful in that way and they could accelerate that process um, uh, greatly as Brock showed in some of his slides. Definitely roads and infrastructure, you know, especially if they're in flood prone areas can be impacted by beaver. Beaver don't create floods um, necessarily. They just, um, they, they basically impound water at base flow. And, you know, if they have a dam, it usually overtops during peak flows and dams blow out. We don't tend to get the epic 12 foot tall dams that beaver create up in the in in Canada and in the in the northeast. Um, so that's less of a concern here of big dams blowing out. It's more just the smaller frequent dams, if if they're in an area where they're trapping base flow, then they might inundate areas more. Um, but we have ways to deal with that. And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, beavers definitely like to plug culverts. That's one of their favorite things to do if, if the culvert is in an area where they're living, in part because it's just seen as a big hole uh, or small hole in a big dam, the road, that they can just plug that and then get more inundation. However, there's all kinds of creative ways that are super inexpensive. We put this one in over in Sonoma and, um, you know, it's, it's all low tech stuff. It doesn't have to be engineered and um, they persist quite well and, and perform quite well actually. In, in Massachusetts, um, 
we learned from the master there who's been doing this for 10 years and has put in over 2000 by now because there you cannot kill beaver period and um, they persist with hurricanes and, and all kinds of uh, um, extraordinary conditions vegetation for those that are wanting to protect vegetation you can wrap them with wire you can also uh, put sand in some exterior grade paint and get it color matched and paint your knots and make it super artistic so you can't even tell the beaver don't like to chew the sand it's it's hard on their teeth so there are ways to protect your vegetation and when it comes to flooding you can put in these simple devices that are called flexible pond leveler devices and we have put these in in several places just as a way to control the height of the flooding and it's basically the pipe goes through a notch in the dam and where you set that pipe sets the height of the water level of the pond and then the inlet is here and it's caged so they can't block it and they don't uh, build they might build a little bit more but then they stop and even if they do build the water just goes out the pipe and so we've had great success working with a lot of different organizations to put these in and you know Beaver exists, as Brock said, in many different environments. We have lots of examples of beaver providing really valuable habitat benefits in both urban and suburban environments. As you can see from these photos, Napa Creek in downtown Napa. We've got some human restoration here on the bank and then beavers. And there's all sorts of um, critters hanging out in here. Similarly, uh, on Tulake Creek, this, this in its height was just an wildlife hotspot. We would have deer coming in here and all kinds of pond turtles and a bunch of other species showing up. And then for those of you who aren't familiar with the Martinez beaver, they are quite famous and they too have had all kinds of wildlife species show up here in downtown Martinez. And they are not, you know, the city was concerned, but they put in a pond leveler device and it's been fine. They have not suffered flooding, especially in systems where you have these lower flows and they're lower gradient and it's you're not getting massive amounts of CFS coming through. Um, it doesn't seem to be a problem. So where do we go from here? Well, we're currently right now reaching out to community and we'll continue to do so to share the results from our habitat assessments. Um, we obviously are looking to community members to help us identify obstacles and opportunities for beaver restoration in Alima and other creeks in West Marin. And then if, if the habitat and political um, conditions support it uh, and there's landowner interest, then uh, ultimately it'd be great to initiate some kind of restoration approval process. And again, it can be with or without beaver um, though those structures tend to do better if you have beaver maintaining them, they do it for free. And then one of the things that we're aware of is that, you know, ultimately there needs to be some lead landowner agency NGO that would need to head up the project and um, secure the permissions and permits and funding. And I'm sure Jerry can talk more about this. Um, but our current understanding from CDFW about a potential Marin project is that uh, there would need to be a project lead and that they would need to get board of supervisor permission and farm bureau permission and so you know when we looked at the map um certainly you know the amount of veg that is in the lima the flow the connection to the wetlands you know beavers can live in brackish water um quite fine as they do in martinez and elsewhere uh on the west coast um you know if if there were no infrastructure concerns or landowner concerns, uh, Beaver would love it in Alima Creek. They would do great and they could provide a lot of valuable habitat for the species that exists there. So um, if you wanna learn more, here's the link to the booklet. Um, if you wanna check that out, download a copy. And if you aren't familiar with the book, Eager, it's also an audiobook. you can learn everything you wanted to know about beaver and it's also really entertaining. Um, we are holding a beaver summit uh, in April 7th and 9th. It's free and it's just going to be two afternoon sessions and we invite you to consider attending at least part if not all of it. You can learn a lot about beaver and strategies. There's going to be a lot of great speakers 
lined up for that. And um, this is a team effort. So we're excited to hear from you all and see what you think and, um, and see if there's any interest in beaver restoration in Alima Creek and what are the, the um, questions. I already heard one about flooding, which we should talk more about. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I keep doing my hot corner slings. I bet that just drives people crazy. <laughs> Uh, hold on here. There we go. I gotta hit escape. All right. So right. here well, we thank are. Thank you uh, so much, Brock and Kate. That was a terrific presentation. And let's, by all means, open it up for questions. And I think we have a small enough group that we could just let people uh, unmute themselves and just go ahead and ask questions rather than having to go through the whole chat routine. But do you want to start out by addressing the question that uh, Ken brought up in the beginning? Um, and be careful, he's an engineer, so you'll have to answer in engineering context. Uh, what are the dangers of, um, of beaver ponds causing flooding in Alima Creek? And uh, how can they be mitigated, as you pointed out in the, uh, in the presentation about the uh, pond levelers? Well, I can take one crack at it, which is, uh, I think, you know, the answer often is it depends. And so uh, there are, as, as any good engineer knows, looking for a dam site, there are better places to put a dam, whether it's a human dam or a beaver dam that impound more water or not. So it, it, we have not had the chance, in, in all honesty, to really walk a lot of Alima Creek and get a sense of that and get into some of the habitat down low. So, um, you know, in the absence of knowing that, as Kate showed, there certainly are ways that if beavers commence to build a le some level of dam that was um, resulting in some amount of inundation that people didn't like, there are ways to mitigate it through those flexible pond levels, as she showed. Um, so it's, it's, it's a it's a, it depends kind of answer relative to where they would decide to show up. Uh, another question that I I'll, got. Uh, I'll say, I think it's, go you know. Go ahead, Ken. I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's less of an issue overall, if it, you know, as long as it's not happening, you know, right, right in kind of Olima proper, which is, you know, relatively, small area, you know, in, in the context of the, the whole watershed. So, and it could actually kind of help things. It could, you know, provide for some amount of mitigation by, you know, providing water storage um, and, and recharge and not just letting, you know, the water come right down the, the stream channel. So I actually think there might be a benefit. And uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. It's very insightful and and um, definitely helps with us all becoming a little bit you know more aware of, of what a what a treasure the, the beavers you know could present so thank you i got a question for you all what the water supply for alima what are those stream sites gallery wells stream side wells or how how's so to your point about recharge would beavers retaining water and spreading it out and that improve the water supply portfolio for Olima or what's the what's that? Um, yeah, not not on Olima Creek. They, it could help, um, you know, on on Paper Mill Creek because the, the wells for North Marin water um, are along that. And um, so there may be a benefit uh, on that actually. Um, so and I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna do a shout out to Dave Press. I, I hope that he might you know provide for some um, you know direct knowledge of the park and and how they look at this. To me, it seems like a really good idea. So you better not go in. Yeah. Hey guys, it's it's Dave Press. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Right. Um, yeah. Also. Yeah. Um, thank you guys, uh, Kate and Brock, for a really great presentation and. And honestly, thank you for, for all the work that you've done. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, obviously land managers throughout California have uh, learned a lot more about 
uh, the North American beaver in California um, based on your work. So um, the work that you've done is, is really quite significant. So thank you for that. And thank you for, for pursuing it. Um, been uh, tracking it for a while and it's, it's nice to meet you guys um, virtually. And I'm sorry, I'm not on um, video, but I actually had to step outside into the dark because <laughs> I got a family and everyone's busy and, you know, anyhow, um, so, and, and just to clarify, Brock, so, um, or, or maybe, and maybe Ken, I, I don't think anybody who's really on a well in, in a Lima, the residents in a Lima, right? I think they're all on North Marin water. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. That, that, okay. That is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so people are not drawing water out of Lima Creek. So I just wanted to clarify that. Well, there are um, some people using it for irrigation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think, yeah, I think that obviously, you know, the, you know, the park service. So, so anyhow, I, I'm the wildlife ecologist for Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, and, you know, we have clear management policies about reintroducing uh, native species to their, their native ranges. Um, and so we very supportive of the concept overall. Um, you know, I think we have to look at uh, the big picture, of course. Um, species, when you, when you reintroduce species, they, they don't necessarily stay where you intended them to stay, or maybe they do, but their offspring don't, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it really needs to be um, a really collaborative project, um, bringing in all the associated stakeholders. So there, there is quite a, a bit of work to do. Um, we've got you know, ranching activities within the Olima Creek watershed, um, the residents themselves, um, the, the park, uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure I'm forgetting, forgetting others. Um, and we also wanna make sure we're in lockstep with California Department of Fish and Wildlife, of course. So um, there's some hurdles there that need to be crossed. And, and you know, I'll, I'll say just from the, from the park's perspective, you know, I think that the timing is, is of course super critical and I, I kind of took a look at the participant list uh, earlier, and I think everybody everybody knows what Point Reyes National Seashore is is working through right now. Um, there are a lot of major issues on our plate right now, and um, you know if we wanted to, if if beavers showed up on their own, uh, God bless them, you know. But if if we were to be a lead uh, participant in reintroducing beavers to Olima, well, we're going to own that. And that's going to take a, um, a significant amount of staff time um, to work through and then, and then manage um, once that actually happens. So, you know, I think that just realistically, uh, the timing's obviously, the timing's not great. I'll be perfectly honest with you, but it's not that it's, there's not interest. Uh, so I, th I think I'll leave it at that. And, and, I, and I think it would, of, of course, also be really important to uh, provide this presentation to um, other folks within the leadership team at Point Reyes. Great. We will have a link that you can, you can give them. Uh, Thank maybe you. Maybe Brock and Kate, do you want to take a look at some of those questions that have come up in the chat and try to address a few of those? Sure. I, um, I started trying to answer them in the chat, but why don't I just speak? the answers, uh, the question about beavers getting along with river otters. They, otters definitely benefit from beaver created habitat and you'll often find them utilizing beaver ponds. Uh, they, can, um, they can eat baby beavers. Um, so that's, that's one concern, but um, there you have it. I don't know, Brock, do you wanna add any more to that about the beaver otter? No, I, 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 I think that yeah, basically, as Kate said, you know, the, the beavers are 100% herbivores. And as we know, otters are carnivores, omnivores. And so the, the cool thing that we recognize with beavers is that they tend to create a whole bunch of habitat for other things, such as frogs and fish and crawdads, all of which are the primary food sources for otters. So uh, otters are a, benef a, a beneficiary of beavers as a keystone. And the degree to which otters may predate juvenile beavers is low enough that we see them coexisting everywhere they, where their ranges overlap and the otters do better when the beavers are happy. Um, 
and then there was a question about drought it's definitely if if the streams that they're living in go dry and get super disconnected and there isn't deep enough water for them to escape predation then yes they they can perish i've certainly uh seen this down in southern california their beaver in the san inez river and that system gets quite disconnected and overdrawn and um so they they can um if you know, it depends on if there are other, if there's other aquatic refuge nearby. Um, but the same is true also in, in high waters, you know, sometimes I know for our beaver in the Russian river, they'll, um, they'll skip over into our gravel ponds, which are right alongside the river, um, both as high flow refugia, but then also um, if, if things are getting low and dry, they can go over in there, so. Uh, one question I could address, uh, and then we uh, have someone else who could address it somewhat. Uh, the question was uh, by Sarah, what is the involvement of the Resource Conservation District? About three years ago, I think it was, I made a presentation to the RCD and the majority of the board members. Peter, was that before you were on there or were you on there then? I can't remember. Let me activate my mic. Um, I think I was there, but the board has changed a little bit since then. Yeah. So we're hoping that the RCD could be involved or at least supportive. Uh, Chuck Bonham, the director of Fish and Game or Fish and Wildlife said that he would like to see that level of support from the RCD as one of the prerequisites for us getting a permit. And uh, we've had good participation in our steering committee by the RCD and Sally Gale uh, has been very supportive and Sarah uh, and so others. But Peter, do you wanna comment on the RCD possible role? Yeah, I think it's uh, it would be a good time to try again, and I, I believe there's probably more uh, interest than there had been when you first approached. And I personally, I would be interested in, uh, you know, trying it again here in Pine Gulch Creek. Ah, great, great, Peter. By the way, for those of you who don't know, is a member of the Resource Conservation District and runs a wonderful farm on Pine Gulch and gave us a super good tour of the work that they've done there, the offstream storage and so on. So that's really great to hear, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Frank Brodick and I live in Olima and uh, I'm from Pennsylvania and I grew up with uh, beavers in the area. In fact, I was on a recent hunting trip back there and was able, was, uh, able to watch beavers for about a week. And uh, yeah, I totally agree that they do restore habitat and expand uh, habitat for different uh, uh, you know, mammals, et cetera. But, I, I, and I, but I'm sure your management, but they also can denude, I would think that, that may be the wrong term, but they can out eat themselves out of, out of an area. I've seen them expand beyond the 100 foot range that you mentioned, uh, going into larger timber and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm, but I'm sure your management plan would address that. For, first of all, you have to get them there. Uh, but uh, would you be open to giving the GPS codes to where you're considering? Uh, putting them first. Well, we haven't gotten to that level of detail. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're we're not even close to that. We've just been, and in, and in Lima specifically, like I said, we've that's the least visited on the on the ground. We 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 looked around the Vedanta area a little bit from the map, and people there was a sense, and I think talking to the fish biologist folks like Eric Etlinger and others who knew more about the stream condition, the, the perenniality of the stream, the amount of pools, the kind of vegetation, they felt like that might be a, a viable area. Um, it's close to the park, so maybe Dave would get his wish that they would just go to the park without him having to take the lead and then he could welcome them in. <laughs> no. Um, certainly one thing about Olima that's interesting is, is down in that lower section of it, you know, as you get closer to Point Reyes and the, and the bay there, where it becomes much more dominated in, in say cattails and things. Beaver love cattails, those big starchy roots and the shoots, and they can just spend their whole time living in a cattail marsh and getting fat. Um, you're, you're entirely correct that they, uh, we've seen them in, in the Sierras and the Rockies on Aspen. And they love Aspen more than anything. And they will definitely go more than 100 feet away to go get them Aspen. It's like candy to them. Mm -hmm. Topography adjusts that. The steeper ground sometimes is harder, flatter ground, the kinds of vegetation. Things like willows, especially that 
sprout, the coppice, you know, they stump sprout. The beavers, like you said, will manage them. They're rotational grazers. They mm. slow water, they irrigate the veg, they coppice the willows, and they, they work through a, oftentimes what is many years to decades in a big rotational grazing cycle, almost like wildebeest on the Serengeti or something. And so you, it depends, you know, the carrying capacity of sites is really variable. I think in, Cal in our coastal area where the riparian tends to be very constricted close to the stream and then we quickly get out and it's either conifer redwood or it goes into chaparral or say bunch grass in some of these coastal terraces, the beavers are gonna be hemmed in pretty tight to staying within that riparian willow, dom you know, maybe alder, but dom willow dominated corridor. So it kind of really depends on the location. There's a question from Christina about groundwater recharge. You want to take that, Kate? Um, does the beaver's removal of vegetation actually allow more groundwater recharge? Again, I think it depends. Um, they're they're really like Prox says they're they're farming aquatic species or or you know those that they really like co-evolved with with those that coppice well so willow and um alder and cottonwood and and things like that and sure i would imagine that once they they do the initial cutting down of, of the bigger stems that that could change the hydrograph some but um their stump sprouting and growing back as well and really what we've seen and brock you can speak more to that but what we've seen a lot with with the groundwater recharge is just the fact that they're keeping that water on the landscape longer into the dry season allows there to be more groundwater recharge, regardless of what's happening with, with the vegetation. And um, I know out in uh, Nevada, in, in those systems out there, they, they, they did a bunch of monitoring with groundwater wells, and there was a significant um, signature as soon as the beaver got in there and started holding water back in the dry season. So um, it depends on your um, on your ge uh, geology as well. Brock, you want to add? Yeah, I, I would. I, I think the vegetative signature is they're they're not necessarily removing vegetation. They're changing the succession state. They're taking. They may be taking larger trees down that are then stump sprouting. There may be an evapotranspiration relationship change in that, but I think what Kate was getting to is, you know, if you look at the history of the manifest destiny of the United States and the westward hoe, the whole game was draining the landscape. So you got rid of the beaver and then you basically facilitated the incision, the down cutting of streams so that you could channelize them, ditch them, basically ditching. And anybody who's tried to dehydrate something, you just dig a ditch and lower the elevation of the ditch so that you can dehydrate the adjacent land and then you can farm it or build on it or do what you want. So uh, beavers are basically, instead of uh, that incision, that's why we had that one little slide with their teeth, they're, instead of degradation, uh, incision, beavers are about aggradation. So those dams are gonna capture sediment and material coming down the system and begin to upgrade it and hold it and rebuild the elevation of the stream corridor where it probably was before contact, which then reconnects to those floodplains. And that aggradation and retention and laterally spreading of water is where all the science shows you get the increased groundwater recharge or retention depending on the geology versus the incision, which is about dehydrating and desiccating systems and, and losing flow. So beaver are really just agents of processes that people know this in, in the engineering community, you put in flashboard dams along creeks, concrete or earthen ones to slow water down to saturate soils. It's their, the physics aren't that darn complicated actually. <laughs> Beaver's just been doing it for a heck of a long time. If you want water in a dry climate, in a Mediterranean climate, beavers are your friends. I got a question from uh, a gentleman who's a farmer along the Lima Creek. I'm sure some of you know him locally. And he asked, is there any danger that beavers, uh, he's pretty near the creek, that would come out and actually eat any of his crops? I'm not sure what he's growing, but he has a two or three acre farm there. Uh, do beavers uh, become agricultural consumers? They do. They, um, 
in Sonoma Creek, they have taken out some lovely Merlot, Merlot vines. Um, so, you know, they're, they're opportunists and if there's something interesting and tasty for them to go try out, yeah, they'll go eat corn, they'll go eat, you know, they, they, they tend to try a lot of different things. And so um, if you're in a situation where your, your crops are close to the creek, then you might have to do some, you know, fencing. And one thing that can be done is just even a single wire, hot wire to keep the beaver out. They're not big climbers necessarily unless it's something like an aspen that they really want to get after. So it's, it's not as hard to deter them as you might think, but yeah, that would definitely be something that would need to be addressed. So either an electrical fence or just a mechanical fence might keep them out. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it can be a short fence for a beaver. It's not like a, you know, we don't need a deer fence that's six foot with two strands at eight foot. Yeah, beavers are, so you, and, and it, it's, again, it's a function of the availability of food. And if, there's plenty of food and, and willows and, and cattails and things that they're primary food. If they're, them coming out to work on escarole and, and a mesclun salad mix and hit you on, and some of your squash and a few zucchinis, meh, maybe, but it's, I, I wouldn't think that's the primary issue. I think we could work that for sure. Um, and, and I don't know what their cannabinoid receptors are in beavers or not, if that's the crop we're talking about, but you know, maybe they're. <laughs> I think fruit trees would be the key concern, Some, something you spend a lot of time growing to have that much yeah. down. So that's really what Kate said is if, if we're talking woody trees, any of the fruit trees or the grapevines, those are absolutely, that's beaver, you know, they love to eat that cambium, that, that thin bark layer. So again, fencing either perimeter fencing it in between the creek or actual individual fencing around the trunk of each individual tree or vine um, or the sand paint that Kate mentioned could work. Okay. Other questions people have? I have a question about the, uh, the major flooding we have occasionally in Olima Creek. It gets to be about 15 feet deep behind my house and floods out into the floodplain. Do uh, what are beavers going to do for a couple of weeks while it's in that stage? They just go sit up on the high water spot and, and gossip with each other and watch it all happen. And then they just follow the receding flow back down. So they'll just get out of that flood corridor and, and sit up on the bank. And, and at a flood scale of that magnitude, like a one, you know, one of these atmospheric river systems, Whatever amount of beaver damming that was down in the incised channel is probably going to be negligible relative to the amount of large woody debris and material racking up and all of the stuff that we all know that happens when we get those really huge events. So they're probably not going to be the... the, I, the get, I get trees that are four feet in diameter coming down the creek and getting lodged <laughs> behind my house. Right. Exactly. So that's what we're saying. I think the, the, the magnitude and the capacity for those storms to move material that is so much bigger than what the beavers are doing, I, I, I think they're not going to be, they're, they'll be negligible as a, as a driver when you've got that kind of flow event. Um, there are some cases, you know, in, in areas that have more regular high flows like that, where beavers will build bank burrows at different heights that they can utilize, like in the Smith River, um, there's incidents of that, but it's that's such a big system with so much more flow. It's um, probably not the same. I know like on Tulake Creek in Napa, those beaver get flooded out and they, we have photos of them just sitting on the bank waiting for the waters to go down. You know. I, see, I see Sarah's asking about when you introduce them, do you, do you use the road culvert tube initially and and so i think that's a, something that a if if there was a, a formal proposal that was getting close and we had some gps points for you there frank a key piece of that analysis would look at um if there were explicit uh infrastructural issues that we were concerned about a specific culvert a bridge crossing that felt like uh, the precautionary principle said part of bringing the beaver in is, is installing a flow control device or a cage or, you know, those things are all 
part and parcel with with a portfolio of of a strategy that would come together with the you know with a proposal so it it's not to say it's it could or couldn't it all depends Oh, I'm so glad I'm so glad you answered that, Brock, because I understood it as protecting the beaver initially, which some people do when they're introducing the beaver, they'll build a temporary lodge, but it sounds like that was the right answer. I did Any put into the chat uh, my email for anyone who's not on our update list, we can put you on the list and let you know as this progresses one way or the other. So feel free just to send me an email and we'll put you on the list. Yeah, and, and I would say too, you know, just if you have other thoughts come up after the fact of like, oh, you know, what, this is a question, you know, feel free to, to reach out with further questions. And if you have any ideas of potential willing landowners, um, you know, it's, it, Brock and I haven't actually gotten to go out and survey uh, a lot of Alima. And so if, if there are areas there where, you know, you know, um, you think there might be good potential beaver habitat and you want to let us know about those, um, we'd love the invitation or um, an introduction to someone that we might want to meet to talk to about that. We might check with Ken and see which landowners would be the best ones to talk to. Okay, are there other questions for Brock and Kate? A great opportunity to interrogate some of the world's truly great beaver experts here. If you need a good Easter present and we sell these organic cotton beaver flag hats and we have beaver stickers, just saying. Or if you do like newts, you know, you might want to get your Chileno ah. Valley Newt Brigade hat. It's really a great item for kids, especially. <laughs> Got to save the newts too. How about a mask? <laughs> beaver mask. That's a, that's a great idea. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess there are maybe no more questions and I wanna really thank everybody for participating, for asking some great questions. We will really keep you up to date on this and Peter, we wanna take you up on your offer to re-engage in uh, Pine Gulch as well. That'd be great and I look forward to that. And thank you everybody for, for participating tonight and especially Brock and Kate, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all thank for you. coming. All right. thank Thanks you. for hosting. Thank you, Gary, setting it up. Nice yep. to see you, Bonnie, Gail, Peter. Thank you. All hey. right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.